talk, of course, about maternal diabetes in infants and diabetic mothers. This would be a better title, IDM embryopathy. Um, I had a lot of experience in Kentucky. Obesity is almost as high as it is in frequency is almost as high as it is in South Carolina. I certainly think it's probably higher, but uh, <laughs> you're number one or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the opportunity for uh, diabetes in the pregnancy obviously goes up with obesity and uh, maternal weight gain. And in addition to that, um, insulin-dependent diabetes uh, of the normal variety, uh, the juvenile or early adult variety, uh, still makes up the minority of diabetes that occurs during the pregnancy. So that you're still dealing with mostly um, obese mothers who have problems with their sugar. And there's a lot of myths about that. I'd like to talk a little bit about that as we go along relative to birth defects. Um, this is a picture from an article that two of my fellows and myself put together in the early 80s. And we tended to focus more in this article on severe cases. Because up until that point, with a few exceptions, people didn't pay much attention to severe cases. Uh, they would uh, report cases with the uh, absence of the sacrum, uh, some with uh, femoral hypoplasia, um, and then uh, some with congenital heart defects. But it really wasn't well known before this article that maternal diabetes can cause very severe problems. And as you can see, in this particular child, uh, there's multiple rib defects. <coughs> sometimes they're bifid, sometimes they're missing. Uh, and this, of course, causes the chest to be very deformed. It may impact uh, respirations. And you can see in this child also, there's limb abnormalities. So the upper limbs, uh, the radial bones seem to be hypoplastic. In this child, uh, the femurs are, are abnormal. One's bowed or bent, uh, but is not missing. And you can see, even with this extreme involvement of the skeleton, when you would expect the thing that brought attention to diabetes, that being sacral agenesis, to be present, well, it's not. You have a nice form sacrum here. So diabetes it doesn't play by any rules that we know in, in regards to uh, drug or other types of chemical uh, problems or maternal problems. Uh, it, it's often asymmetric. Uh, it can be um, mild or severe. One part of the body can be severe, another part be mild. And then of course, uh, they can, one of the major manifestations is hairy ears, which causes no problem and disappears after a while. But this child's mother was a gestational diabetic, not requiring insulin. So those of you who have been told that gestational diabetes is something that does not cause birth defects, better change your minds. And it's also important to remember that probably up to 40% of gestational diabetics 10 years after they delivered will have sugar problems and or overt diabetes. So when we're saying gestational diabetes, we're actually saying that there's a potential there that there's actually overt diabetes going on. And, and some of those women, of course, who are gestational diabetics require insulin. And those individuals that require insulin uh, and can't be treated by diet or, or pill therapy uh, uh, tell you already that there's a major issue with their problems in their future in regards to diabetes. Dr. Allen, can I stop you for a second? Yes. So your, this example um, is, uh, you're saying is very severe and you're saying it doesn't, um, covers a broad spectrum of malformations, but you're saying that the classic or what's recognized as a classic malformation is agenesis of the sacrum. That's what brought attention to that because 
that's a very rare defect. And people started paying attention to those children born with absence of the sacrum. Uh, and they happened to notice that some of the mothers were diabetic. And that started to bring attention to that. And that's so for many, for many years, people thought that uh, sacroiligenesis was the main feature of the embryopathy, when in fact it's one of the lowest frequency features. Yeah. Um, so only the fetuses or children of the mothers who have diabetes will have a possibility of having this, but what about the mothers who are obese or have very high BMI? Um, if they don't have signs of diabetes, they would not have, they would not have this. Uh -huh. But there is some evidence that very morbidly obese mothers, besides having a high frequency of prematurity in their children and respiratory distress because of that prematurity, have an increased frequency of neural tube defects and cardiac defects. But that's not proven. This pregestational, pregestational diabetes do you say called pregestational diabetes? Mm -hmm. uh, well, to, to, address, to address that point, they've actually done pregestational treatment on mothers who were at risk of having diabetes. And that reduced but didn't eliminate birth defects in their children. Uh, so that, that and those, some of those children still had macrosomia. Mm -hmm. So they were large children. One of the things about the children who are just large is they may predate the diabetes causing birth defects in subsequent children. So you always pay close attention to mothers who have very big babies. Uh, that may be the first sign, even though there's no other problems, of future risk. Mm -hmm. In Kentucky, maternal diabetes is the third most common etiology of anomalies in children. And it's, it's similar to that frequency in all the states that have an obesity and diabetic uh, problem. In our state, at least, in Kentucky, one or two percent of all pregnancies are associated with maternal diabetes of some variety. 80% of these are gestational diabetics, but remember a third to a half of gestational diabetics require insulin. Can't be treated with diet alone or medication. They have to be treated with insulin. And then the uh, ones who are, excuse me, the ones who are insulin dependent make up about 20%. Now that frequency is going down. The numbers aren't going down, but the frequency is changing because obesity is going up. They're getting more gestational diabetics because the obesity is going up. The uh, insulin-dependent diabetics uh, are not going up. So it might be, if we did a study today, it might be 85% uh, are gestational diabetics and 15% are dependent, insulin-dependent diabetics. So just an estimate, one malformed infant and diabetic mother per 1,000 pregnancies. Uh, there's an 8% risk if the mother is poorly controlled uh, that their child will have birth defects. If the child is well controlled, it's somewhere between 2 and 4%, depending on what the background risk is uh, for birth defects. Also, it's important to know that the uh, stillbirth frequency is increased in frequency in infants and diabetic mothers. It's as high as 12% in some of the reports that who uh, are available at the time. In non-IDM pregnancies, it's 1.2%. So there's something going on in these pregnancies that increases the stillbirth rate. Here's a, here's a statistic from a study that was done again showing you that diabetic mothers that were malformed made an incidence of 1 in 1,000 uh, frequency and a stillbirth frequency of 12%. <coughs> Do you think that the stillborn are, are uh, acute, or, or is this, uh, uh, you know, like is it something to do with the labor, or is it something to do more with just it's, the pregnancy? It doesn't have anything to do with labor, right? But it is frequency associated with thrombo, uh, thrombosis, uh -huh. and some of the complications that the fetus may have to deal with because the mother's diabetic and the blood flow is decreased. 
But these books with malformed children, they're not all apt to come to term. But there's increased frequency in them of, of uh, silver. Gloria mentioned that macrosomia occurs even with good control, or what you call excellent control, or pre-pregnancy control, uh, which tells you something else is going on other than just the effect of insulin and the sugar levels themselves. If we could determine how maternal diabetes causes birth defects, turn the world of uh, teratogens and how they, they cause problems on its head because it has everything, every dynamic. It's a soap opera of teratology. Uh, and if we understood it better, we'd understand a lot of other uh, ways that uh, chemicals and drugs can cause uh, teratogenesis. As you know, of course, uh, even a child who doesn't have birth defects but is hypoglycemic can have birth damage as well. I didn't mention it, but one of the things to keep in mind is children with multiple anomalies because the mother's diabetic are not macrosomic. They're either normal or small. So it's very uncommon to have a macrosomic <coughs> child uh, with multiple birth defects. Uh, and the mother under, under good control. Some of the other problems here you see You see thrombosis, uh, they often have a high uh, red blood cell count that would also increase the frequency of thrombosis. Uh, the, the umbilical cord is the most common area for thrombosis, but you can get uh, thrombosis in the central nervous system and other places. The cardiomyopathy, which is hypertrophic, is uh, the child may be born with large heart, respiratory distress, and radiologically and by uh, EKG have a cardiomyopathy. This is usually treatable and usually goes away. Whereas other congenital cardiomyopathies usually don't. But it still can be lethal if it can't be treated effectively. At what age should we expect it to go away? Most of the time within one month, two to four weeks. Do you see other organomegalies or only cardiomyopathy? Well, if the child's macrosomic, then uh, the other organs, while they're large, usually not out of the range of normal. This It's a different, it's a physiological problem for the heart, and, and no one knows exactly how that works. Here's a classic non-malformed child who's just macrosomic. Mother was a gestational diabetic. Uh, note the ring across the nose, I've got an arrow pointing to it. This is because there's no other place for the fat to go, so it folds on itself. This is one of the few disorders in which you see this ring going across the bridge of the nose. It's a good thing to observe. That and hairy ears and being a large fetus are all indications of maternal uh, diabetes. Here are the hairy ears, if you don't believe me. And again, this regresses with that usually a month or so. They don't get extra hair anyplace else. This is just the ears. And of course, ear defects are common. About 30% of the children who have malformations will have a, a ear malformation in IDMs. This is White's classification of maternal diabetes. This helped the doctors uh, develop some type of idea of what sta state the mother was in, diabetically speaking, uh, so that she could be classified. I just want to point out here that, that, that the F to R insulin dependent mothers uh, almost always had serious complications to the diabetes, and death was not uncommon in these mothers, and the children had a very high frequency. Of uh, being malformed and a high frequency of a lot of the other things we were talking about. Hemoglobin 1C does have some predictive value, and you can see the uh, levels here in two different studies. 
and how they correlate with the frequency of malformations. So it is important to maintain the pregnancy and the uh, sugar situation with the mother. It does reduce the risk, but in no way does it eliminate the risk through factors that we really can't identify at this point. Just a list of things, all, every system in the body just about is at risk of being malformed uh, when the mother's diabetic. And of course that risk goes up the more severe the diabetes and more frequently uh, insulin is required. And you can just go through here and you can see it does form a little system. We, we can take regions and isolate these regions with these various defects but it is a very broad path. <clears throat> Obviously, no, no patient will have all of these. Some patients will have two or three of these. It's really unusual to have just one defect in an infant diabetic mother. There are usually more when there are any malformations. And looking, looking at that list, are you going to discuss how they how those um, traits present in adulthood, or I mean, some of them are obvious. And, uh, Do you have one in particular you want me to? No, but I'm I'm wondering. Well, most of these are going to present early along. The ones where there's renal defects uh, may not show up or be diagnosed for many years. Can you can you can you give us a sense of how many of these infants just go undiagnosed, um, or is that I mean it's probably not known exactly, but. I, would, I don't know, it's not known, because most of the people who would be seeing these patients primarily uh, are not going to pay much attention if the child only has, let's say, VSD. And yes. that, that's why I say it, 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 is, it is helpful if the children have more than one defect that's known to be associated with diabetes. Those that have single ones, or other things that people won't even think about. Polydactyly, for instance, the preaxial polydactyly of the thumb. If that is the only feature, uh, or if there's a heart problem, some of them might think, well, this is uh, a syndrome, but they won't think of diabetes. Mm -hmm. that's, I guess that's what I'm going is, it seems like patients these days more and more are going to be, when they're stumped, it's going to go to exome, but really it's all about the gestational period. Exactly, right. that's, and that's a very important thing relative to, in particular, teratogenesis is the gestational time and uh, taking a good history. Now, some of the things that the, the baby may have might have you in your own mind ask the mother a very directed question that will bring out whether some of these defects were, were present or not. Here you see the hairy ear, very mild descriptor. Here you see a child, look how small the buttocks are. They're that small because there's no sacrum there, and the nerves that go to the buttocks are underdeveloped. The spine actually stops here. There's no sacrum, and uh, so this is this can be missed, by the way, uh, for many, many months and occasional years. I've seen it miss for as long as 12 years, because no one pays much attention. Says, "Oh, he's got a tiny tush," and, and that's it. But why, doctor, does he continue to have these frequent urinary tract infections? Well, because the bladder isn't functioning normally or the kidneys malformed, and it's not picked up until someone x-rays the spine or does urinary tract evaluations. The polydactyly is always pre-axial. So it's always the thumb side and always the big toe side. Why? I have no idea. We knew that, we really know a little bit more about polydactyly. But it's just very typical of uh, infants and diabetic mothers. Sometimes this extra digit comes off down here, off the middle part of the foot. That's not seen in any other disorder. So when we see that extra digit down on the middle part of the foot, I've seen it down to the heel, we think of maternal diabetes because that's what it's going to be. The tibia is missing here in this individual. That's why the foot is turned inward. So tibial agenesis, tibial hypoplasia, 
is common with this extra digit uh, and with a club foot, as it's called. Absence of the femurs are common, common in the sense of major malformations in the diabetic. They're not common if you had 100 patients who had malformations because of diabetes. They might make up 5% of the cases. And then that absence sacrum would be a little bit less frequent. Some of these other things that we were talking about are much more frequent. See another child with the crease across the bridge in the nose. And are the agenesis and the extra digits primarily lower extremity, or is that? They're, they're usually upper and lower. Yeah. You don't usually get four limb. Uh, Pre-axial polydactyly, the people would be just feet or just uh, hands. But occasionally, you get, I can you'll see it in one hand, on, and then on the foot on the opposite side. Again, doesn't play any embryological patterns. It's just all across the board. Here's a child who has a small, slightly malformed ear, small mandible, had a cleft palate. So these children can present as Pierre Robin sequence as well. So people, again, if there's maternal diabetes in, in the pregnancy, uh, then there are would be other features. Now, I don't see in this child uh, extra hairy earlobes. So that might not be a clue, but there might be uh, spinal defects or rib defects or lower extremity defects. But there's about eight or 10 Syndromes, and I think I've got a list of those later that can be confused in, in, as infants and diabetic mothers or infants and diabetic mothers can be confused with those disorders. And here are two of those disorders. Hemifacial microsomia can be seen in infants and diabetic mothers. Where one side of the face is small, the ear on that side is malformed, and then sometimes there's pre regular tags. Hits. And then the lower two is oculo-auricular dysplasia or golden heart syndrome. And here you see the classic feature of golden heart syndrome, the lipodermoid of the sclera cringing on the iris. It, this has been reported in some eight to ten cases. And it seems to be real, but that's not enough cases given the number of IDM embryopathy cases to really make that clue. I make it true, but it is important. You see in the upper left-hand corner of the cleft lip and palate can be found. Cleft lip alone can be found, and cleft palate alone can be found. So again, a multitude of defects, singularly or multiple. Is there any kind of difference between mothers who are hypoglycemic and mothers who are hypoglycemic? You mean the, the mothers? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Most of them are going to be hyperglycemic or in the early stages maybe hypoglycemic because they're putting out a lot of insulin to, to break down the sugar. It does, but the defects don't seem to relate to the mother's uh, hypo versus hyperglycemic state. Most of them are hyper. Early on. Later, they could be normal or hypoglycemic or they could fluctuate in the same 24 hour period. Is there some correlation between having a lot of sugar in your stream and then probably that aids in the microphonic appearance of the child? The insulin is, is a growth factor, and they do think it plays a role, but it's not a one-to-one -one role, so they can't really substantiate that. And remember, I was telling you that the, the more severely affected children are not macrosomic. And so there's something different going on there in regards to insulin because most of the mothers with the severe cases, the majority are going to be on insulin. Um, the patterns uh, are really not patterns in a true sense. They involve these systems primarily, but they can skip any of these systems or delve into each system in the same patient. The pattern is often asymmetric, irregular, and unpredictable. Uh, often the absence of the sacrum is associated with absence or hypoplasia of the femur. 
or the common regression syndrome that is not necessarily related to diabetes, but those are features that can be found in the common regression syndrome. But you can have patients who are missing their femurs and have their sacrums normal, or vice versa. So again, it's, it's uh, one defect does not beget another. I'll show you this picture because uh, Trifling 13 is one of those conditions that can be confused uh, with infants and diabetic mothers because they have polydactyly, they have clefting, they have, can have central nervous system defects, uh, but uh, the trisomy 13 patients have postaxial polydactyly, frequently, uh, as high as 60% of them. Uh, so if that's present, that's not going to be the explanation for the child's other defects. And also trisomy 13 can have and often does have whole prosencephaly, which is another feature in infants and diabetic mothers that you can see. Encephalocils are found in uh, infants and diabetic mothers with increasing frequency. Uh, they are usually occipital, not always, but usually. You can see this child has hypoplastic radius. You can see how the hand angulates towards where the radius would have been. This is an infant of a diabetic mother. They, they can have regular spina bifida, uh, mild meningocils as well. And here's a child who has essentially no sacrum, and that's allowed the uh, hip, hip bones to come in close together because the bladder and everything is, is hypoplastic in those situations. And so you don't see this separation. But nope, that's the femurs. And here's an individual who has no femurs. These bones, the femurs should be where these bones are. This is the foot, the lower leg, and there's no femur here on either side. But nope, there's a sacrum. Again, to make that point. Other people in other countries have, have identified that gestational diabetics and insulin-dependent diabetic mothers uh, all have an increased frequency of birth defects in their children, but just much higher in insulin-dependent diabetic mothers. And if you have good control, this is showing you that the risk of having, uh, if you don't have, don't have good control, the risk of having a birth defect is much increased. So again, it is very important for good control. It's also very important to have good early control. A lot of these defects are going to have occurred by the fourth to the eighth week, fetal week. So this screening that the OB doctors do at 28 weeks is not going to avoid almost any of these things that we see here. So we, we're not very good yet at how we're going to screen Pregnancies, particularly that are at risk for diabetes or because of obese pregnant mothers. Note here that sacral genesis in the IBMs is 5.3% and less than 0.1% in the general population. So there's a big difference here. You can see 53 times more common. The spinal defects are 66 more times more common. And most of these defects are at least 3% or so more common in infants and diabetic mothers. This is other parts of the, of the body, uh, but now it's, it's the same parts, but showing you essentially the same thing. This shows you the pattern of abnormalities. We had 47 patients at the University of Kentucky that had multiple anomalies whose mothers were diabetic. We took those 47 patients and tried to determine what the frequency of each of these systems, heart, limb, spine, ear, eye, and uh, kidneys, were not formed normally. And as you can see, the majority are not the more severe diabetics. They're the gestational diabetics. And these, these individuals had multiple defects 
that are seen in infants and diabetic mothers. So the, the security of the relationship is, is pretty good because of that. We wouldn't put a patient in here who, who just had, let's say, a heart defect and whose mother was diabetic. Here, here's a, uh, this child was a twin, uh, and uh, identical twins have a very high concordance. Non-identical twins don't. So that tells us that there is some genetic implications to how these babies respond to maternal diabetes. Note the extra digit with the, the uh, tibia being missing, and note that it's now on the foot. Here's another one uh, with the extra digit bent over. And note that these are all preaxial. No tibia here. And you can see the small mandible. The femoral hypoplasia, unusual facey syndrome, uh, was reported by uh, myself and uh, Dr. Dimmel in San Francisco and uh, David Smith and others. Uh, and what we found out was is that two-thirds of the patients, the mothers, were not diabetic, but one-third were. So uh, there's obviously other causes for this pattern, but the, the largest known cause is maternal diabetes. Heart defects frequency is three times greater. The types of heart problems don't usually involve the valves, uh, but they, they run the gamut of other uh, defects. And one thing I want to point out to you is that situs inversus is increased in frequency in infants and diabetic mothers. And uh, not any other forms, but that particular form is increased in frequency. Uh, so that what that means, we're not quite sure, but it does affect laterality in some children. These gestational ID human anomalies compared with anomalies of non-diabetic non mothers. And even among gestational diabetics compared with non-diabetic mothers, there's an increased frequency of birth defects. And that held up for the whole person separately. Spine defects and urinary defects. This is not my study. Boris Kusov in Florida is the one who reported this. Here's a child who has uh, a diaphragmatic hernia. The bowel is up into the uh, right chest. You can see all the bowel bubbles up here. That's not a known association, generally speaking, but there are a number of reports of diaphragmatic hernias in infants and diabetic mothers. So if you see enough infants and diabetic mothers, you're going to come up with some low frequency, unusual defects. Uh, we had uh, a child who was the infant diabetic mother who had multiple defects, who had a bifid tongue. So it was split from the front to about two thirds all the way back. We thought, well, we've never quite seen that. So we looked at literature, and there's two other cases. So whether there's a relationship or not, uh, we were not sure, but that's a very uncommon defect. So it may be a very low frequency feature in infants and diabetic mothers. Here's a child who has microcolon. That's another feature. This is the colon. Normally, we bet three times, four times as wide. It will occupy, obviously, much more of the lower abdomen. But microcolon is a feature. And it can cause constipation, rupture. If left alone, and the child can be uh, treated effectively over a period of a few months, this enlarges. And it then persists as a problem. But it's one of the features of uh, emphasis of diabetic mothers, and that's microcolon. The cause of the dysmorphology that we see in IDMs is not established. There have been many, many theories, and we know that hyperglycemia must be a factor, but it's not the only factor, and it may not be the critical factor. The one that gets the most play is oxidative stress, negative effect on antioxidant enzymes or genes, and then nutrition deficiency states in uh, some of the lipids may be involved, and also that it's been raised, the folic acid deficiency may in fact be a factor, but that's not been established yet. 
fact, it's been in a couple of small reports repudiated. Or as we might anticipate, the dysmorphogenesis is multifactorial. Takes a lot of different things going wrong for there to be an IDM situation in the child. The summary is poorly controlled IDM increases risk, double uh, at least. Good or excellent control reduces but does not eliminate the risk. And this would tell you that there needs to be earlier uh, evaluation of the, of the pregnancy. And gestational diabetes can be associated with increased in incidence of all of these anomalies that I've shown you, as well as the insulin dependent pregnancies. And I mentioned the screening may be need to be altered. And it is the most preventable uh, birth defect that we, we have uh, after neural tube defects and fetal alcohol syndrome. Yet it's still going up in frequency. Pattern of anomalies not BM is broadly predictable, but unlike other teratogens, is not consistent in the individual patient, and one defect does not mandate the presence of another. These are the disorders that are often confused with uh, IDMs. And you can take, you can break down the defects in these disorders, you can see why they might be confused, particularly if the history is not known of the mother's pregnancy, or if the person assumes that the gestational diabetes that didn't require insulin isn't the cause. So they look for other causes, which is not wrong, it's just that uh, they'll, they'll outfox themselves sometimes doing that. These are almost all involve uh, bone deficiencies. Many of them have an increased frequency of sacroagenesis or sacrum, sacral hypoplasia. So it, that's what brings them into the differential. And there are others that are less common than these.